told you earlier about, about the keys, but now I've got my material hot in the forge and I'm going to the forge to get my material and start forging. I come back to reheat, we're going to uh, need more fire. Yeah, that, that, this could have been hotter. We had our four forge at idle, forge at a low speed, low temperature, but I think I can do it. Do not put the seven degrees in until I'm almost finished. Because once you start a parallelogram or a rhombus, as some people call it, it grows instantly. So well, now I'm just going for size. I know I'm not small enough yet, but I'm going ahead there. I'm getting close. And I have my caliper there. I do with the other key here. I'm going to use another key to measure my height. I've got a good height. Now, I'm going to measure, I'm going to use an old key because you need a three-way caliper or another caliper to get this dimension. And I didn't bring another caliper, so I'm going to measure, I'm good with an old key. So now I want to check my small end while I'm getting close. And I'm close, so I'll keep forging. Two thick back on the hip end. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna put my angle in and I'm on a bottom key, so I wanna turn it to the left. I'm gonna come up on edge. other end, the small end down, I always forge that small end down so that when I'm upsetting, it won't, uh, when I'm driving it out, it won't upset and spoil the, the hammer from, uh, the key from coming out. Now, at this point, I'm going to take my bottom key out, turn it off. Set it aside, put it right here, it's good. Now I'm going to stick this in and see how she fits because I don't think I got it quite small enough. Well, I got close, but you can't see it from there, but I'm undersized here. And actually, all I need is a couple more blows on that end out there, and I am perfect. And I've got uh, Hold that there. Do it slow. Go ahead and get right. it. I'm checking my end up here. Remember, this is the size we wanted, but I wanted it. Let's see how much underside I've got it. That's okay. beautiful. Hold it there. Hold That's it. beautiful. The more, if you have it too much undersized, then you have upset it too much. You want just a little. Now, all I need to do is hammer this in here just a little bit because you see, 
I'm too tight there. I'm too tight not there. I'm too tight right here. I'll have to put the key back in my hammer. And actually, there's enough heat left here. That's not the one. My key is here. I want to make sure I've still got oil, and I do. And I'm going to make sure it's going up the way it is. I'll tighten that quickly. And I'll forge this key down a little bit more. I can do it cold. It's not really cold. It's hot. See, when you've got only the one hammer, it takes a little extra time because you've got to knock that key in and out. you got the second hammer, it's much better because you can go to the second hammer and forge the key. You never have to do what I'm doing now. But I think we're close enough that we're going to be fitting. Okay. That's really close over there. But if, if you could see from this back side, I've got slack in my key. Now I'm going to take this, although it's not coming all the way through, I'm going to take the hammer and tap it once and see where the high spots are. It may come right on through. It is coming through. Now I want to back it out and see where I'm making contact. And I'm not going to hold that back key now because it's hot, but I'm going to be very careful here not to hit my dovetail. If I do, I'm going to reach and get my wrench that we talked about earlier, and I'm going to put it on there and drive my key out a little bit. Could have been more than that, but it, but it was okay. Now, with my tongs, I'm going to pick out this key and I'm going to come, let's all take a look. Well, we're making good contact at the end, and we're not touching any place else, except that I see a little ding on the top, and I don't like that. Uh, so I've got the option to either forge that down a little bit more, or let me put the other key on top of it. And you know, I have other calipers. Give me another caliper. You should have really three calipers for this job because we have three dimensions that we're forging. And I want to set this caliper to that dimension. This dimension of the key that came out of there. Really close, but not quite. Beautiful. Now, this needs to be that dimension. You see, it's a little over. Not much. That's acceptable. It's just really close. And if there's any problem with it, I'll do a little grinding on it later, but there won't be any problem. I gouged this somewhere and made that little burb that I was worried about. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to the rosebud now. I got to put my clip back on. I'm a firm believer in tongue clips because they do the work for you and you can put your hand up closer to the work and not have to worry about the danger of the piece falling out. What we're going to do now is we're going to the uh, to the uh, rosebud and heat well that's hitting right there perfect. We're going to heat that end anyway it's hitting on the end almost. We're going to heat that end and upset it one inch behind where it goes through. Okay, now the rosebud is over here. Let's get it started. Do you mind? I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, solicit the help of my helper here, Ian Willie. Uh, this is really a, a two-man job. As I look at this more, 
I see my forging, and let me show you. My forging here is not quite good enough. I'm gonna heat this and forge it again. You see, when I forge this dimension back down, I hit the high spots on the edge, edges, which is typical of forging here, it bulges, and then when you forge it back to make it flat again, you want to forge until you're completely flat. And I'm, I have a concave in the center, which I don't like. So I'm gonna put it back in the fire quickly and just lightly forge the whole thing and it won't affect our finished product. But uh, that's not pristine. And I like pristine, I want my key to work properly and uh, this will be better. Okay, now we've reheated our, our key. I'm gonna take it out of the fire and with my tongue clip. And I'm also, this is a very important part of quality forging. I'm gonna brush the scale. Don't leave pieces in the fire any longer than you can, have to. And try to use a neutral or a rich fire, not an oxidizing fire, to prevent scale. I need to do just a little bit of hammering here. Then we're going to uh, let this cool while we take the key out again. Brush off, before you take your die out, brush off the scale from around it. Let it go down. You can accelerate it going down by pushing your treadle, releasing the Now let's see how she fits. What I didn't do was I didn't forge the uh, end, and I should have forged the end a little bit. Let me drive it in and see what happens. I didn't forge the end out there. Oh, no. In the reforging. Is it coming through? That's enough. That's, that's close enough. We're going to have now a good mark here. It's going to grow in this direction always when we're heating it. I'm going to knock it back out now. King our key back out very gently with a hammer and it's good and loose there but if it were not good and loose what I would do is I would take my tool that we talked about earlier, my drift, and I would put it here and drive the key through. It's possible now for this key to drive all the way through, but I'm not gonna drive it out now because it would damage, it would fall out, and I don't want it to fall out. But what I am going to do is I'm gonna drive it back in because there's something else that I forgot to do I wanna show you. When I'm doing these keys, I take my white, my keel or my white, pencil and I mark where both ends of the die and now I know when I look at it again where it is the contact is inside the die you see so we would not go too far uh, so now I'm going to knock that loose again be very careful not to hit my die or my dovetail came right out nicely now I will bring it over. First I'll get my clip, because that's going to be hot, and I want to hold it safely and firmly. 
I'll put my clip on and I'll come. Now look at the two marks that I've put. This is, represents the dovetail in the ram. Now I'm going to turn it over on the side and take a look. Let me see that upper mark. The upper marks are here on the back side and here on the front side. Now that looks like it's not in far enough, but as we work on this, that key's going in the die further every time a little bit. Every time it's going in further a little bit, and it's going to get longer. And if it happens not to be sticking out enough when I finish, I'm, I'm on the, the edge of the window here. I would really have preferred to have been about here. But it's okay. Uh, now we're going to take the rosebud. Now you see the contact. Yeah. Only there and not touching here anywhere. So we're going to heat one inch of this with the rosebud and then we're going to upset it in place. But to show you what I'm going to do is I'm going to move quick. After heating that, I'm going to cool this tip so that when I drive it back out again, it won't upset it. Okay? Now we're going to the rosebud over here. And I've got a gas saver on my rosebud. So I'm going to heat one inch behind the mark. Not, I'm not worried about this mark out here now. I'm looking at my contact inside. So I'm going to heat one inch. Just, I don't have enough gas on. I don't have enough fire. That's a little bit rich. That's better. I'm going to heat, I'm worried about my contact point right there. I'm going to heat one inch behind it. it takes a little while to heat a, this large a piece of steel, but just be patient. You want it good and hot, soaking heat all the way through, otherwise you can't upset it. The center part will not upset. What I would have been smart to do would have been gone to the belt sander and grind that edge down just a little bit. Notice I'm working on a metal table so there's no problem with heat here. But I'm holding this up. <laughs> I'm a little weak these days uh, with my medical, medical condition the way it is. And so I'm using all everything I can to support me. And help me. Uh, normally I would just hold this up in the air. But notice I'm rolling it, getting the heat all the way around, and I want a really good soaking heat so that the center of that iron is hot. And now I'm confident that the center of that iron is hot. I'm going to keep the torch on it, and I'm going to go cool this tip so that it will not upset when we drive it out. Now, this time we're going in, the clip comes off, and we don't need any on there. We just need to drive. We don't need a backup. We don't want a backup yet. Okay, now then, well, we didn't gain anything, and I thought we would, but we were right back where we started, which means I had almost no upsetting to do. Now I'm going to take a look at it now, knock it out. Take my tongs and clip, get a hold of it again. Now you can see we widened the space. It was a little tiny spot there before. Now I'm 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 a little uncomfortable with this because uh, I didn't go. I didn't have enough sticking out. I should have had that a little bit smaller. But I'm going to go ahead with it because I think it's okay. Uh, 
I think it'll wind up okay. Now, we'll go right back. You see the wider section that's been heated, been made contact? I upset that. Now I'm going to upset another inch of it. You will not get a full one inch upset with a one inch heat. You'll get a little less than that. So we're going to heat right behind it. Another thing I could do now is I could go to the grinder and, uh, and grind that off just a little bit. So it would go in just a little bit farther so I'd have more sticking out the end. But I think it's going to wind up really good. And if you've got a, like a baiter grinder, once you finish, you can uh, go to the platen and, and, and equally grind the whole surface and make it go in a little bit farther. If you do that, you want to put it back in the fire again and make sure you get the scale back because the scale is important in uh, not sticking. And also notice that before I finish, I'm going to mark this as the top. Actually, I'm going to mark it with a B. It's the bottom, not the top. But I've got these white marks here that tells me every time which way to index it in. So I'm not going to put it in wrong anytime. You know, we've got a good heat here, but I want to cool that in. It becomes less important to cool that in the further you get up the... Uh, the key because it won't it won't get much heat on the end as you go further in. If we had more sticking through, we would. Now give me a backup. Good. Now I'm going to mark it again because I know we went through further that time. Yep. And we can see on the back side, and when we take it out, that the mark will be a little further towards the big end than it was the first time. Be careful. Do not hit your die or your cell block. Back with the tongs. And now you see, first, we've gained a little bit. We put it in further. And we've got more contact back here. So now we're going to heat back another inch back. Show me that again. I want to see the, the, uh, the contact. White mark. I want to see the white mark. The white marks. This was where we were. Let me put the pencil. This is where we were before. And that time we knocked it in further. Let me go back. Let me go up. Okay. Okay, this is where we were before. And now I've knocked it in further because we've actually, this has been hot as well up here, and it has actually squeezed in a little bit. I know it does that, and I knew we were going to get growth here, and by the time we're through, we're going to have growth out to about here, and then that point, this uh, key will be just the right length long distance. Okay, back to the, uh, back to the forge. Now one thing you have to watch here when you're doing this is that you don't bend the key, now I've bent this key just a little bit, which means I was hitting it not completely square and to bend it down. Well, what you do is you go to your anvil, and I don't have one of my anvils close by, but here is a little swan anvil, and you just take that bend out of there. There we go. You should do this instantly when you bring it out of the fire so you've got more heat left. But now our piece is back closer to straight again. Back to the rosebud. And we're going to heat another inch above our contact. This one here will put us halfway through to the end. Quite frankly, once you get halfway through, boy, you got enough contact on that key, you're just not going anywhere. And you could actually skip, put three or four spots in here and not have it making contact 100%, but having it make it 
contact at three or four different places. Three is enough. One here, one here, and one here. And uh, it would uh, hold. I like to get it, spend a little more time, and get more contact. We're doing good with our heat. Just be patient. Make sure you get a soaking heat. Otherwise, as I said before, and I'll repeat it many times, uh, the center of the steel will not be hot enough to upset. You'll be just stroking yourself. We're getting good and close. I'm going to, uh, I'm not even going to mess with cooling the other end now because there's not enough heat there that'll do any upsetting when we drive it out. Ian, I want you to uh, be ready, but don't put the hammer there until I call you. I'm making sure that I go in with the chalk marks up. It won't go in all the way, but it will when I start hammering on it. Okay, Ian, hold my back up. Let it go. Great. No need to hammering anymore because the metal is cool now and it's not going to upset. Look, we've gained again. And you'll see when I come out. It's going to be hard there for a little bit. Actually, that piece is still, I can see back in the back here. That section's still got a little bit of red in it. Not enough red to do any real upsetting. And you notice I've been very deliberate every time so as not to hit my dies or my dovetail. Now then, let's set it down and take a look. You see we gained another quarter of an inch and we've got contact further back. But we didn't gain as much as I thought because this is undersized a little more and I thought so we're going to go right back to this spot here again and upset it a little bit more but you see how much contact we've got there it's almost a hundred percent show me the uh, bottom yeah right there we've gained this much again all right Ian I'm yes. gonna let you heat this and I'm gonna sit down you want to heat it out above this last contact mark you heat it right in here right in, right in there this way a little bit more we're a little past center Uh, that's good. A little bit further towards it. That's good right there. Oh. Ian is helping me here now. Uh, I don't want to cry wolf or anything, but I'm a little bit on the weak side. Most of you know my condition. I've, uh, it's just about two weeks to the day that I had my last major surgery, and I'm in in the recovery period, I have uh, one more chemo session that starts, I take it tomorrow. And after the chemo, I will be in uh, radiation for a period of time. And, but as it is, mind over matter has got me back working again. Uh, God's not through with me. Uh, I have things to do, and uh, I believe he's just sent me a warning signal. And. Uh, now we're getting close. Ian is helping me. And I'm resting. But I want to do this job myself. The major part of it. And it's good, Ian. We're going right back in. Making sure that we got our marks up. Chalk marks are on the up position. I'm going to, I don't think I'll need you at all this time again. Okay, that's as far as we can go. Now, I'll mark it again so we can see if we've gained any. Now we've got enough key out there. I'd like a little more. Not much. 
I don't like long keys sticking out here because frequently we forge from this side. And these keys will be put you in harm's way with that ram coming up and down. And I will actually trim this key before it's done. I'll trim about oh, half to three quarters of an inch off of this key and then regrind the leaf in it, the relief there. It's cooled enough now. I'll back it out. Actually, folks, I'm missing something. Shame on me. We oil this every time. And I have a system of doing that, Ian, that you don't even know about. So I'm going to educate you. And I, as I take this key out, I want to remind you that I've made a mistake. Always, I lubricate, you can't lubricate this hot key, but you can lubricate the dovetail while you're working on making keys. So I have this little swab, and every time we finish forging, we swab it with oil. And there's a lesson to be learned here. I never hide my mistakes. It's just a little piece of wire with a, with a rag attached to it that makes a swab out of it. We dip it in oil and we run through the dovetail. And so anyway, uh, you, if you're not careful, even though it's hot, you'll get galling here. We won't lubricate that. If you can't lubricate this, it's too hot when it comes out. But lubrication will work inside the dovetail. And every time we come out for a new heat, we lubricate the, uh, the dovetail again. The boy in the dovetail. We're looking really good here. And we're going to do another heat now, right here, okay? And that's going to get an upset. You can see actually the difference in the diameter of the stock uh, because uh, fortunately, I, I, I ground this one, I forged this one pretty close. We're not showing much upset. But if we did have uh, more, uh, if this were thinner, boy, it would show up a lot between the difference in this stock and the section we've upset. Okay, I'm going to put the tongs back on and we're going to heat another section and get ready to do it again. Number one, I need to put my glove back on. I'm sure most of you know about these gas savers. But, boy, they are really good. I have uh, this side shuts the gas off, and I built onto mine a stand to hold the torch while it's burning. So if it's something I want to heat, and I need two hands to hold it, well, then my torch is held there. And, Ian, would you come, please come heat this? Because yes. I need to. I'll try not to talk while I'm away, because I have to make... We're, we're, we're just above the, uh, right the mark, yeah.
going to upset that again. We're going to go right back in. We've already lubricated. And we're going to put our right side up. After I do it this time, I'm going to uh, mark. Oh. Okay, back it up. Good enough. We will have gained a little more sticking through. We're getting perfect. But we're going to mark it and knock her out again. see that we've gained a little more in distance and we've gained a little bit more in contact. So right here, Ian, okay. you want to heat this section right through here. Gotcha, Tom. Can you turn it over and show uh, the initial how much length we've gained? We've gained another oh, three sixteenths of an inch. And now you see we've got plenty sticking outside of the die. We're going to gain a little bit more. And the first thing we're going to do while Ian does this, I'm going to lubricate. Well, now, this is a good time. Pretty soon we're going to finish this and we want to make sure I always know what the top is while I'm doing it because I have here these pencil marks. But we need, this is the bottom die, so we need to put a B on there. So we're going to take a B, stamp with a B, and we're going to come back out to about right here. Anywhere along there is fine. Okay. That's good. And we got a B on there. Bottom key, the B always goes up. Ian, I'm going to let you okay, reheat that. And I want to tell you folks something else. Uh, as a, When you check your hammer daily, check the oil. We talked about this earlier, but these hammers do not require much oil but they do require oil. There's, a, there's an oil gauge in the back. Don't let it get too low. If it runs out of oil, it's gonna seize your piston. And as I talked before, that's happened several times. And it's repairable without buying new parts 99% of the time. But it might be that if you do it bad enough and run it long enough, it will ruin the piston, it'll also ruin the cylinder, and that's a very expensive repair. Don't run them without oil. Now I'm going, by the way, I'm gonna lubricate again. I'm gonna lubricate again every time between keys. I'm gonna run that swab through there, but between upsets, I'm gonna run that swab through there and lubricate come, yeah, come back to me a little bit now you're doing good even uh, yeah even a little further back this way would be fine this is a new experience for Ian so it's a good learning experience I'm having him help me and uh I need the help from an energy standpoint and also I need him to learn by, by doing it, not just by telling it. You don't learn by uh, somebody telling you something, you learn by doing. Oh, I put it in wrong. Isn't that horrible? T tap it back to me. We may have to reheat again. I'd rather reheat a little bit more. I come close to making a mistake. Now, that may not be a mistake. On these particular hammers, that wouldn't be a mistake. So let me explain to you again that if either side of the dovetail, female or male, were slightly out of uh, the dimension, 
then you would have a different dimension at the top that you do at the bottom. One would be larger than the other. If it were just one thousandth different, when you turn this key upside down, you'll double the, the factor and it'll be two thousandths different, which means that the high spot is the only thing that's going to hit now and you're not going to hit the low spot. So your key will not be affected. That's why we always mark our keys and we always put them in the same way every time. These hammers that I'm producing today are, I have found, uh, are 100% square, parallel. But I'm not taking any chances with it. There could be a mistake. And if there is, when you make a new key, just, it's no harder, no more difficult. Make, orient, orient it up or down. Now we got our hot again. I'm gonna put it in right this time. Check yourself. And never try to hide your mistakes. Hold it. Good. Looks like we're really doing abuse to the hammer, but we're not. Uh, this all is solid. If you were doing that on the top, you would have a backup all the time because of the, what I mentioned earlier about the ram. Now I'm gonna mark again, and we've gained quite a bit that time. I'm gonna knock her right out. If I were having any galling, that wouldn't come out of there easy like that. There would be extra material in there and uh, you wouldn't get clearance as you started coming out. Now, what a nice upset. We gained quite a lot in our side. We're, we're getting almost finished and we gained a lot in our depth, okay? We're gonna make about two more heats and we're gonna be finished. Folks, there are no shortcuts to this. If you want good tools and you want things to fit right, you gotta do them right. And it takes a little time to make a key. Uh, I've, made, I've made hundreds of them. Uh, when, when my hammers, when I first started using these hammers, the dies were never the right size. The dovetails were uh, a few thousandths off, and I was never pleased with the keys, so I made new keys uh, for every die. If a person bought a hammer with four sets of dies, that meant I had to make eight keys. And then I would mark them all, uh, bottom or top, and then whether it were a flat die or a drawing die or a combination die or a fullering die. So I had a code for all that. Just the first letter of those dies. Uh, bottom flat, bottom BF is bottom flat. And uh, bottom fullering, which has the same letter, I'd put FL on that. So uh, we're gonna get a good heat here now, a little bit further back this way, right on in there. And here again, you can take shortcuts. Uh, and they'll work fine. You can have it touching down near the end of the key where the die is. You can have it touching in the center, you can have it touching near the end. And so if you're really pressed for time, you can take shortcuts. You won't have to heat and upset so many times. And that key will hold good. I just prefer to do it the best possible way, which is uh, upsetting about an inch each time. Looks good to me. We did the oil. I'm going to oil right quick. And I'm going in with it, with the right side up. Take off the dies right, right quick. And I'm going to drive her in there again. We don't need it. We don't need you this time at all. Good. 
I'm going to mark again. Beautiful. Now we've gained again. We've got really nice contact from here all the way up to there. And we've made progress here. It's the only further. Now we got enough die sticking out there. From this point on, I'm going to have you hold an upset, but get me back in this sport direction. Now some people, I've seen people, Misforge this. Let me come back around a minute. Misforge these in the beginning. They had it fitting here and it was too uh, thin on this end. And they tried to upset from this end. Drive it in and then try to upset that. Boy, that's not very, that doesn't work very well. You can do it, but it doesn't work very well. Uh, and you better have plenty sticking out here because you're going to lose some of your stock as it goes in. It's better to have it just the way we're doing it. Small fits here, undersized here, and just upset and back your way out of the key. Come on back a little bit, right there. Okay, folks, we're going back for one more heat. Here I am, not lubricating. Don't pass lubricating. We're going back in with our key. We're going to do this, and then one more heat, and we're going to be finished. Hold it in. Good, very good. Now our marks are gonna be almost at the same place. We will gain just a fraction. I don't need any more out here. We'll knock her back out. Out of the camera's way. This key, although it's not covering the entire width of the dovetail will not come loose. Okay. This 6150 is very tough stuff. It's hard to upset. But what I like about it is, we may be, you boiled it, that's fine. Give me a heat right in here now. Skip over that and give me a heat right in there. Right here. Right, right in here where my finger is. Uh, the, the thing I like about the 6150, I told you, the, the thing I like about the 6150 I told you earlier is that it, uh, it has a scale on it that is uh, super uh, strong against galling. It slips in good, it, and it's really uh, hard to gall one. Uh, yeah, right there and on the back a little bit. We're actually going to have, we're going to be satisfied with this, or we may do one more heat. This is upsetting very, uh, very hard, it's hard to upset. If you're using 4140 or 1050, uh, or even 5160, which is pretty hard also, uh, it would upset much faster than this. Now come up a little bit, right along in there and heat me. Spread that heat out.
What you don't want to do is heat it beyond the point where it goes in the uh, dovetail because if you do, it'll upset outside the dovetail and you can't drive it in. Got to be, all the parts that's being upset must be done inside the dovetail. That looks real good, Ian. I'm going for it. We have lubricated earlier. Yes. And I'm going to get rid of my tools really quick and drive her in there. Okay, hold it, Ian. Very good. Now we're not going to be completely through covering 100% of the surface of the dovetail, but one thing that has happened, and I'll show you, The die has slipped a little bit. See it here? And that makes the key stick through a little further. So I'm gonna knock the die back. No harm, no harm done. The tapers are still fitting good. And now we are about 60% uh, through there, but we're, we're gonna do it again. I want to do it back further here now. Okay. I haven't been using I haven't been using 6150 long because I just got a supply of it a uh, few months ago, last year in fact, and uh, I, I tried it and I found it real hard to move, but boy, I found it really good to keep galling down. Uh, yeah, we're getting really close to the end now. You could heat this faster, actually, in the gas forge, but then you'd have the whole end heated and you'd have to quench it, lose some of your heat, and uh, this is the best way. Now, personally, uh, here again, I don't mean to brag, but I've gotten good enough at doing keys that uh, I don't use the rose, rosebud anymore. But I've got two hammers. I draw the, the uh, key on one hammer, and then I use the flatter to knock the high spots down, and uh, I would have already had two keys made and finished by now, or maybe three. But that's a higher level of forging, and uh, and you've got to put a good keen eye on it, get it really close. There'll be a few little high spots, take your flatter on the flat dies, bring those down before you make one fit really good. Uh, I couldn't make a uh, I couldn't, you couldn't make a living making keys this way, but you can have to invest the time in making your own keys. Uh, one or two or three or four keys, uh, you can afford that time. But if you're gonna make several hundred of them, uh, you're gonna need to have learned how to forge tapers really nice, Finish off with your flatter and be done with it. I like it. I'm almost. Okay, hold me in. Okay, that's good enough. That's going to be, it's very difficult 
to upset right out at the end because the heat is outside. And so we've got more than enough surface here now. Contact to hold that die just as tight as it can ever be held. Now we're going to simply let this finish cooling. And what we've got is a key. Huh. It needs a little more. I'm sorry. Ian, we're going to have to heat uh, one more heat right in here. Okay. Don't get it up to the, uh, to the marks. Well, it's okay. This mark back here is the one we're talking about. Right in there, right in there. This would work. We can make it a little bit better. One more heat. You want this? You want the? Uh, let me get the clip on. we're going to do when we finish here is we're going to cut this off so it's not sticking out too far. You notice I used extra material to make the key. That gives me plenty of material to hammer on. And then we're going to cut it off so that about three, uh, four inches at the most are going to be sticking out the other side. And the way we made this one, we don't need to cut it off because we've only got about two, two and a half inches sticking out on the side, follow me if you will, that you're going to be forging a lot and that key will not be in, put you in harm's way in a short distance like that. Uh, the sow block key here, for instance, before I finish and let this hammer go out, I'm going to cut that off. You got to be careful. Don't cut it off so that you hit the sow block. I may leave, this one's okay. It's inside the anvil. But I, I, I would really like it if it were a half inch or so shorter. And uh, that's going to be, after we do this heat, we're going to call it a wrap on making keys. Not simple. Lubricate again. It's hard to over lubricate. Uh, it's safer to over lubricate than it is to under lubricate. But again, if you over lubricate the hammer, the too much oil on that long, big bearing surface will cause friction and it'll rob a little bit of your power. Okay? Now, as soon as we finish this, I'm going to do a couple of forging demonstrations. I'm going to make a hot cut hardy and I'm going to make a nail header. Uh, and I like that demonstration in both of those demonstrations because. It shows you a wide range of things you can do with uh, within one forging. And making the nail header in particularly, uh, uh, I will take, uh, I'll take the time to talk about that as soon as we finish this last heat, when we are ready. Going in the right side up. And that is really close to being too hot on the outside, but it's good. Hold me in. Let her go. Turn loose. Now hold it. Finished. I'm going to mark this key while it's in the hammer where we're going to cut it off. Right there. Now we're going to knock this key out and let it cool. No heat treating necessary. Okay. Finished key as soon as we 
Well, let's see. Does it bend a little bit? It is bend a little bit. I want to heat it with the rosebud there so I can straighten it. See the bend in it? Let me put it up where you can hold it still. But that bend in there is because I wasn't hitting straight. In this case, it was because I was hitting up instead of straight in. We'll straighten that, heat it up a little bit. No harm done. Okay, then uh, back to talking about the forging I'm going to do and I'll tell you about that as I go along. We're going, I'm going to make a hot cut hardy. And I've made a special swedge block uh, that uh, just for making hot cut hardies, our hardy tools, period. And uh, I started making these because you can't buy one. Every hot cut hardy that uh, is available that I've ever seen is a cold cut. It's not a hot cut at all. And uh, the people make cold cuts out of them because the steel is not uh, good enough to make a hot cut. And are, they don't know anything about making hot cuts. Uh, a hot cut, I'm gonna draw right here and I think the camera can see it. Uh, a hot cut has a very small taper all the way to the cutter. A cold cut comes like this and has a big taper. So it's got a lot of strength behind. They're normally tapered a little more than that. Got a whole lot of strength behind the edge to support it. This has no strength behind the edge, very little, but it will penetrate hot steel very quickly. I make my hot cuts out of 5160, and I heat treat to a very dark straw, about three quarters, no more than one inch of it, okay? Now, the problem with people using hot cutters is they leave it in the iron too long. And if you leave it in your hot iron too long, uh, folks, you're gonna get it hot and take the temper out of it. If it ever turns blue, you've lost your temper. And so, uh, and then the other thing that people make a mistake with, with hot cuts when they're grinding them, they grind them quickly to get an edge back. They're, they're, they're slowly turning their hot cut into a cold cut. You must, when you're grinding, come all the way in and keep the same tapered edge that you'd have in the hot cut. So, uh, now, the way I make them, uh, there's plenty of steel. Look at it from the side. This being your edge, and this being the step where it goes into the hardy. And now up on edge, back in this area here, I leave extra material so that after a few years, if you've had to regrind and it's getting short or getting too thick, all you gotta do is put it back in the forge and simply draw it out again. Bring it back up to the height you like and reheat treat it, grind it, you're in business. And I generally grind uh, before I heat treat. Uh, but uh, uh, heat treating becomes a little difficult for a lot of people. Uh, there's two types of heat treating. There's the old fashioned blacksmith type where we take and we quench, we heat the whole section so it's above non-magnetic, which is above 1,475 degrees, not too much above that. And then we quench 5160, we quench it in oil. And then uh, we make sure that three quarters to one inch is good and quenched, cold. And the way you can tell just by looking is the oil will crack and bubble up and crack on the surface. Well, right quick like, go to your belt sander and sand the entire surface off because you're gonna have excess heat up in this part of the hot cut that will creep its way back down. And you watch the creep as it comes back down. It'll start 
with a light straw and the, it'll, the straw will get darker and I want to wait until we get a dark straw at the cutting edge and then what back in the oil again. I don't soak the whole thing in oil then because maybe there's too much heat left up here and you could cause a fracture line just above where you're heat treating. So just stick it back in the oil again. Then I go and sand this side off real good and look and see if the color's coming down again. And if it is and starts getting too much heat left up here and the color's coming down again, by the time it gets to my straw that I want, I quench it again. Okay? And normally you won't have to do that more than two times. So one of the keys is heat plenty of steel up here. I should have a hot cut here to be showing this. One of the keys is to heat plenty of steel above so you got reserve heat. Okay, I'm on. Okay. Perfect. Now we got a good key, nice and straight, and it's going to fit. We're going to cut it off here, but we're not going to do anything to it. We're going to let it air cool and it'll get a bit of hardness in it that way. And uh, we're not going to quench it, but we're going to air cool it. I, I always put my, my uh, hot iron never on top of the forge or on top of a table or anything. It goes out of harm's way under the switch block in this case, right in next to the forge when I'm forging or under my anvil when I'm hammering by hand never on top. Now folks, as I promised you earlier, I'm going to do a little bit of a forging demonstration. And what I've done, I'm going to make a hot cut hardy and I'm going to make a nail header. When I make my hot cut hardies, I start, I use 5160 and I start with a billet like this. In this case, I'm going to make an inch and a quarter hot cut, which fits the anvils, the Ozark pattern anvils. All right, and then, so I take my piece of steel, I know what I need in size, and here's an important thing. I run a bandsaw edge cut right here, and on the opposite side, and that's gonna be the place where I butcher off a section that's gonna make the tang, all right? And then, after I do that, I will forge it down to near the right dimension, excuse me, but the other tool is over here. And then I will put my kiss blocks, which are inch and a quarter, in the power hammer, and I'll draw the tang precisely to inch and a quarter, all right? And it will then fit in the new switch block that I've made, and I'll show it to you in its entirety before, because I have five different sizes, three quarter, seven eighths, one inch, inch and an eighth, and inch and a quarter, all right? Now I can forge those all precisely within five thousandths of an inch under the power hammer using ki double kiss blocks. So I'll set that aside. Now, also I want to call to your attention to really expedite things. I've only welded half of this rod on. Well, uh, most people, until they really learn to forge and hold their iron straight, that'll break right off during the forging process. However, uh, I, I forge it and hold it straight, and I, and I rarely ever have had one fall off. It was a bad weld if it fell off. And what I do is, once I get it ready, fully forged, and ready to go in the swedge block, I simply put it in the swedge block, and, and that weld will break right off. I don't have to go to the chop saw. This weld will break right off, the handle's gone, and at worst, I take it to the grinder right quick and grind this mild steel off so I don't doesn't interfere with my finished product because this end is going to be the cutting end of the uh, of the hardy. Now, so the first stage is this. Now I've cut off this end. I forged my tang. The second stage is I'm going back in the hot in the swedge block, and I'm going to forge this down and make these shoulders flat like this. And so the third stage after getting that set is to draw out the cutter. Here's one freshly drawn 
just the way I draw them. Take a look if you will. And we've got a nice taper. This is the finished forging without grinding. And then I take and measure parallel. While it's in the block here, I put parallel blocks. And, and let me turn it around so you can see the mark. I put parallel blocks to make sure that my cutter is parallel to the anvil face. All right, and then the next stage is we take and go cut it off with the chop saw. And the third stage after that is we grind it like I've ground this one and heat treat it. And the heat treat you can see here is a very dark straw. Can you see that color with the camera? We can. Oh, very dark straw. Now my, I'm not going through the heat treat process now, but now my, uh, my uh, hot cutter's finished. Ready to be polished up a little bit, but please look that there's been no grinding going on anywhere except on the cutting edge. You can do precise forging with a little practice. Okay, now I'm gonna take all this off. We'll put one of these in the fire, which, and, and you, I wanna clear this table because I'm gonna show you the nail header next. Well, by the way, butchering is I've done with, the, with this butchering tool and it's very important. That looks like a 90 degree angle, but it is not. It's about 87 to 86 degrees. If you had a, a, plumb, a flat square up here, it would kick out of your hand. And so this needs to be downhill just a little bit and it will drive straight in. I'll show you that in a brief moment. Now also I'm gonna show you another thing. It's real easy to cause coal shuts where you do butchering back near the, near the shoulder. But once I forge that down, and get my butcher in, I'm going to put my, uh, my a little half round fullering tool away from the butcher a ways, and I'm gonna forge down there, creating a, a point that sticks up like this, a rounded point, and then when I forge that, it'll spread the metal out and I won't have a coal shot. Show that again up there. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna forge this piece so that right next to my butcher area, out towards the end, it's, you'll see it, I'm going to have a little bit of a domed section. Now I'll forge the end out, and then I'll come back and get this, and it'll squash the metal down and not cause the pushing back that will, will generate a coal shot. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of these things now. All of these tools are off and gone, and I want to get to the nail header. It, Okay, I start making nail headers with a piece of 5160, and I've already radiused off the edges, and, and I'll show you why later, uh, because that's part of the forming it into the round. And I use a pair of tongs dedicated for this job. You see, they've got the stoppers in them. I'm going to be pushing and trying to create a shoulder right here. And when you're pushing on tongs, they slip up on the material. Well, I don't want them slipping up on the material. I want them to stay there because I've got a, a another uh, chainsaw, I mean a bandsaw mark. That's where I want to do my forging. And so I'm gonna forge from here and make a piece that looks like this in one forging. One heat, I'm gonna forge this taper and make this round in one heat. The next thing I'll do is take this piece and forge it round under the power hammer, okay? And the next thing I'll do is make the dome on the nail header. And I'll do that with these two tools here. I put this under the power hammer, put the flat piece in there, the unforged piece, which is already round, in like this, and I'll use this forging tool, which is a half round, sort of, and I'll forge it right down in there and make the dome. Okay, the reason we put domes on nail headers is it so that when you're forging the nail and you want to put faucets around the edge, it will not, your hammer will not hit. I've been using this tool for about, oh golly, 15, 20 years. It used to be about this tall, and you can see how it's compressed itself, all cold forging. I've used it so much. And uh, I made one at that same time for my good friend Phil Cox 
this is still about the same original height. It's simply a dome. Let me roll it for you a little bit, and you'll catch the shape. Perfect. That has not been touched in 15 years, okay? 10 years or more anyway. This tool, which is my cupping tool, or my fullering tool, uh, I, I just make a saddle and put it on the dies. I'll show you. I put it on like this. You'll see later, but I'll show you in slow motion here. I put it on like this and I cup it like that. And at the same time, I push it over, bring it around like this and put my touch mark on it right here. Okay? So I don't want this tied down. It's not going anywhere. It would go someplace if you hammered it cold, but I've got control of it here. I've got a piece of steel in there. Okay? If you're making your own uh, hot cut hardy or any hardy tool that goes in your anvil, then make sure that all the edges are radiused and that they're not sticking out inside because they get hammered on and they get dinged inside and if you put something in there that fits that hole then it will not be tight. Okay? Now, I, I for my anvils for the most part I've always made the uh, the hardies and everything right inside the anvil, okay? And uh, you gotta watch that because if you put them in there when they're fit to be too hot, the shrinkage will still make them loose. And I have found now, I wouldn't make uh, hardy tools for years and years because I like tight fits. But what I have come up with is a system. I have made this swedge block. This is a piece of 4140. And I took it and had it water jet cut so that it has a very slight taper. Uh, it's only about uh, three or four degrees in the taper going down. I have a three quarter, a seven eighths, a one inch, inch and an eighth, and an inch and a quarter. Now, I make hardies and sell them. If you don't if it doesn't fit exactly, if it won't go in, very little bit of grinding, if you've given me the right measurement, a little bit of grinding on the shank and you can make it fit your anvil tight. If it happens to be a little bit loose, you can take, let me show you here, let me get one back up here. You can take your welder, a wire feed is best, and a spot weld here, a spot weld there, a spot weld down here, and on the other side, okay? And then you can grind those and make them fit right in your anvil and it'll hold tight, okay? Very nice and tight. I do not, see how, see how nice and tight that hardy is? I don't like tools, typical. I see it so many times. People have hardy tools that are about that loose in there. Well, you can't work with that. You can't work with that, but you can work with this. It's there.